Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session today, uh, Young India Intensive Sunday Critical Care Webinars. So today's session is on intra-abdominal infections, uh, something we see all the time, especially in these uh, surgical ICUs. And uh, it's very important to get it right because uh, the antibiotics, the diagnosis, especially peritonitis, are all uh, to be handled carefully. And the speaker today is uh, Dr. Vikas Deswal. He is senior consultant at Medanta Institute, uh, Gurgaon, and uh, he's specialized in uh, infection disease. So he's a senior consultant in infection disease, and it would be nice to hear from you, infectious uh, disease specialization. Thank you so much. Please uh, so share the stage. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Takesh, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'll just share my slides. Are my slides visible? Yes, please start. So, uh, very very good evening to all of you. Uh, so, today I, I will be discussing an approach to intra-abdominal infections. Uh, before I move forward, these are my necessary disclosures. And this would be the brief outline of my talk. What I've done in my talk is that I would be discussing some case scenarios and then try to reach a diagnosis and, and uh, uh, try and discuss how we manage these cases. And all, during this, uh, all, I would also uh, review some of the literature uh, supporting the evidence-based medicine. So I would be dis briefly discussing about acute peritonitis, intraperitoneal abscesses, liver abscess, acute cholangitis, and infected pancreatic collection post-acute necrotizing pancreatitis. So uh, brief anatomy, we all know the abdomen is divided into nine quadrants by two horizontal and two vertical lines. The two vertical lines are the lines originating from the mid-clavicular point and the two horizontal lines are the uh, upper one is the subcostal line and the below one is the transtubercular line. So an understanding, a basic understanding of these uh, nine regions of the abdomen actually help us localize uh, where actually is the pathology and what could be the possible pathogenesis and like, uh, likely diagnosis in that particular case. Now, uh, we also need to understand what is actually peritoneum. Peritoneum is actually a serous uh, membrane which actually lines the abdomen it uh, along the upper surface and it, in, the, in the bottom part, it actually connects to the pelvic. Now, there are two kinds of uh, peritoneum. One is the parietal peritoneum, which is the outer membrane, and the one is the inner uh, peritoneum, which is the visceral membrane, visceral peritoneum, which actually lines the visceral organs and actually protects them from various kinds of injuries and the forces and the pressures inside the abdomen. The space inside the peritoneum, the space between the visceral and the parietal peritoneum is known as uh, peritoneum. And this, uh, whenever you have an infection in this space, it is known as peritonitis. The structures posterior to periton uh, peritoneal cavity are known as the retroperitoneal uh, structures, and whereas the structures inferior to the peritoneum are known as uh, infraperitoneal structures. Now, coming to my first case, this is a 48-year-old male who has a chronic liver disease, child oopsie with esophageal varices, presents with fever, chills, increasing abdominal distension, and pain abdomen for the last three days. He has pallor, he has icterus, his fetal edema, uh, by, uh, respiratory system examination, cardiovascular system examination was normal. The abdomen was distended, uh, there were dilated veins, there was uh, diffuse tenderness, and there was shifting dullness present, uh, denoting that the patient had an ascites, which and probably he has developed as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Now, uh, coming to the case, uh, and, uh, thinking that this patient probably has a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, an ascitic tapping was done and the fluid was sent for analysis. The TLC in the fluid was 2,200. Uh, there were 95% neutrophils. Protein was 1.9, glucose 39, and a uh, high SAG of 1.9. So a diagnosis of a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in this patient was confirmed. And uh, now uh, uh, this patient was started on therapy and a, a cytic fluid analysis was repeated after a few days and with treatment he improved. Now, uh, what are the learning points from this case? Now, uh, what are the different types of peritonitis? We need to uh, know whether uh, it is a primary, secondary, or a tertiary peritonitis. Uh, what are the common organisms in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is a common uh, cause of uh, peritonitis which we see in chronic liver disease patients? And what should be our empirical antibiotic of choice in these patients? Now, what is peritonitis? Peritonitis is an inflammation in the peritoneal cavity as a result of contamination with microorganisms or chemicals. Uh, this is how we classify peritonitis. It can be localized 
If it is a localized peritonitis, you will have only localized finding restricted to that area only. And the, uh, in that situation, the most likely pathogenesis is intra-abdominal abscesses. Whereas if you have a uh, diffuse peritonitis or if you have diffuse findings, then this can be further subdivided into three different types, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary is usually seen in patients who have uh, cirrhosis, uh, like chronic liver disease patients, those who have nephrotic syndrome, and those patients who are undergoing a CAPD dialysis. So uh, in primary, you will not invariably find uh, any structural or anatomical defect in these patients. That, that is why it is also known as primary or a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Now coming to the secondary, secondary is usually secondary to some sort of uh, structural, anatomical, or functional defect in the bowel. This can be secondary to perforation. This can be secondary to laceration or a necrotic segment of the GI tract. This can be following a blunt abdominal trauma uh, because of uh, the injury to the bowel. And then we have a tertiary peritonitis, which is very rare. It is usually seen in patients, those who have a defect in post immune response. And the infection, infecting agents in these patients is usually a very low virulent organism uh, which usually do not cause infections in uh, immunocompetent hosts. So primary is uh, no underlying structural defect. Secondary, when you have a structural defect in the uh, bowel or anywhere in the peritoneum. The, uh, tertiary is when uh, usually seen in those patients who have uh, defect in host immune response and infection due to a very low virulent organism. Now coming to the microbiological etiology of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, as expected, the enteric gram negatives like uh, E. coli and Klebsiella are the most common pathogen, uh, supported by this data from uh, a tertiary care center in South India. Uh, also, data from uh, Christian Medical College, Vellore. In this, this was a very interesting study. This, in this study, they actually divided the uh, patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in three different groups. One was a uh, comu completely community acquired, second one, Second group, uh, healthcare associated, and third group, uh, nosocomially acquired spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. They found that the E. coli was the most common organism across all spectrums of uh, uh, peritonitis. Whereas, if you look at uh, 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 like uh, culture positive healthcare associated peritonitis, then the most common, uh, the second most common organism in that setting was Enterococcus. And if you had a nosocomial acquired uh, peritonitis, the second most common organism after E. coli was actually Klebsiella. So there was a slight difference in uh, microbiology uh, with regards to enterococcus and Klebsiella uh, in healthcare related and nosocomial acquired peritonitis. But by far, E. coli is the most common cause of uh, uh, peritonitis across all spectrums, be it community acquired or a healthcare related or uh, nosocomially acquired peritonitis. Now, uh, as I was discussing earlier, E. coli followed by Klebsiella and uh, uh, other enteric GNBs like uh, Proteus enterobacter are the common cause of uh, primary peritonitis. Uh, primary peritonitis can also occur because of enterococcus, anaerobes, and streptococci. Now, there are some special situations when we will find a slight change in microbiological etiology. And these situations are like those who have a C uh, those who have a peritonitis following this CAPD dialysis. In this setting, because the CAPD catheter is inserted through the skin. So very uh, so uh, in this situation, the skin organisms like Staph aureus, Staphylococcus, and Streptococci also play an important role because the catheter is actually inserted through the skin into the peritoneal cavity. So uh, in this situation, the most common organism would be Staph aureus followed by Staphylococcus. In children, especially those with uh, nephrotic syndrome, uh, because of comp the complement deficiencies and defect in the pathway, uh, streptococcus pneumonia is the most common cause of primary peritonitis. Secondary peritonitis is usually polymicrobial and depends on the microflora associated with the primary disease. We'll come to this a little later on. Uh, now, what are the risk factors for primary peritonitis? The risk factors are uh, very straightforward. Cirrhosis with decompensation, especially those pa uh, cirrhotic patients who are presenting with GI hemorrhage. Actually, it is one of the indications for giving a primary prophylaxis for preventing uh, primary peritonitis. Somebody, uh, CLD who has presented with a GI hemorrhage uh, is an indication for giving a uh, primary prophylaxis for prevention of uh, peritonitis. Uh, also, uh, low acidic albumin concentration is a very important risk factor for development of primary peritonitis. 
Now, pathogenic coming to the pathogenesis, pathogenesis can be hematogenous, lymphatic, or transmitted or direct transmural migration from an intact blood wall, it is not very clear. And there are various factors in the cirrhotic patients which are actually playing simultaneously, which actually leads to an increased risk of primary peritonitis. And they are, uh, because of impaired destruction of bacteria by a reticular endothelial system, because of uh, impaired intracellular killing by neutrophils and monocytes, and there is impaired optimization of bacteria uh, by, uh, by the neutrophils, and also because of low complement levels in the ascites, all these factors actually preclude for the development of primary peritonitis in a cirrhotic patient. Now, coming to the diagnosis of uh, primary peritonitis or a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, uh, it is fairly straightforward. You, you do an ascitic fluid analysis. You find that the, the, the ascitic fluid analysis has a high SAG ascitis, and you have ruled out the secondary sources of peritonitis like perforation, laceration, or any structural or anatomical defect in the uh, uh, bowel, uh, then you can say that this is a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, when you are uh, obtaining the samples uh, for the uh, TLC and DLC, you send the sample for gram stain and aerobic culture also. And it is also a good practice to inoculate the uh, 10 to 12 ml of acetic fluid into a blood culture bottle, which actually helps to increase the amount, increase the yield of uh, isolates in a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Now, uh, this uh, peritonitis can be of two types. One is the monomicrobial non-neutrocytic bacteriocytis. Uh, the name says a lot of things in this situation. It is only one organism is isolated in uh, uh, the peritoneal fluid and the polymorphonuclear count that is neutrophil is less than 250. On the other hand, the second type is culture negative neutrophilic ascites. In the neutrophil count is more than 250, but there is no growth in the bacterial culture. Now, uh, how do we select antibiotics for uh, treatment of a, uh, somebody who has presented to us with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis? If the patient is hemodynamically stable, uh, then in, in this situation, the drug of choice is either injection ciprotexime or ceftriaxone. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable and he is at risk for MDR pathogen, then in that situation, we should cover for an ESBL production and the drug of choice in this situation could be meropenem or artapenem. If the peritonitis is nosocomially acquired and the risk of XDR pathogen, if your hospital XDR rates or a carbapenem resistant rates are pretty high and the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then in that situation, we need to go uh, upfront with polymyxin based combination therapy we, may we can combine it with uh, TG-cycline, minocycline, or any other agent like uh, phosphomycin uh, in this situation. Also, we can use the newer BLBI combination like cefazidim and vectum plus minus estronym, depending on the type of isolate which we are expecting in this situation. So uh, uh, this is how we select, uh, very important to understand where the patient has acquired the infection, what is the clinical status of the patient and what is our uh, antimicrobial resistance profile. So we need to keep these three things in mind when we are selecting antibiotics empirically in our patient. Uh, one is uh, the, where is the infection acquired, second the hemodynamic stability and third is the antimicrobial resistance rates in your hospital. Now uh, the duration of uh, therapy in uh, patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is usually five to seven days. You repeat an ascitic fluid examination after uh, 48 to 72 hours. And if you have noted that the ascitic fluid count has fallen by uh, 80% or uh, the TLC has uh, become less than 250, then in that situation, you can stop antibiotic at five days. If that has not happened, then you continue antibiotic and repeat the ascitic fluid an analysis after to, uh, 48 to 72 hours again. Now, uh, the short, uh, shorter the therapy it seems to be the buzzword, new buzzword in the ID circles. So uh, this was a uh, very old study with, uh, which was actually looking at uh, the duration of therapy in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. They were looking at short versus long courses of antibiotic. And there were uh, 100 patients in this study. And in this study, what they found was that there were a significantly higher bacteriological cure in patients who were receiving shorter course of antibiotic therapy compared to longer course. The hospital mortality was also significantly lower in the short course group, uh, which was 32% compared to 42% in the uh, long course group. 
and uh, uh, we are always very concerned when we are shortening the therapy about the risk of uh, relapse or a risk of reinfection. Uh, very interesting uh, data originated from the study was that the risk of uh, recurrence or risk of reinfection were similar in the two group. It was 11.6% in the short course, whereas it was 12.8% in the longer course of antibiotics. So shorter uh, duration of therapy has been proven to be a equally good, if not better than a long course of antibiotic in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. The maximum duration of therapy is five to seven days, depending on whether the follow-up uh, acetic fluid analysis, uh, your neutrophil count has improved by 80% or has fallen below 250. Now, coming to the prognosis of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, the short-term mortality, as I discussed in the previous study, it was it is somewhere around 40%, and one to two-year mortality is 70 to 80%. Now, what are the poor prognostic markers? Is uh, somebody who has an AKI, somebody who's presented with a hypothermia, hyperbilirubinemia, and hypoalbuminemia, or other uh, poor prognostic markers? Now, who all needs a pro uh, prof uh, prophylaxis for primary peritonitis and cirrhosis? Uh, those patients who have acetic fluid protein less than 1.5 gram per deciliter, those who have had more than one episode of primary peritonitis in the last one year, and those who have presented with GI hemorrhage, as I was discussing earlier, all these are indications for primary prophylaxis, uh, uh, prophylaxis for primary peritonitis in cirrhotic patients. The agents which we can use for uh, prophylaxis are norfloxacin, ceftran, and ciprofloxacin, and the duration varies. Uh, from uh, syndrome to syndrome. If you are using it as a primary prophylaxis, the duration is seven days. If you are using it uh, without primary prophylaxis, uh, that is as a secondary prophylaxis, in this, that situation, the duration is six weeks. And now quickly moving on to the second case, this is a 52-year-old male, analgesic abuser, presents with severe abdominal pain, vomiting, and shock. On examination, he is in deep shock. BP was 80 by 50. Uh, pulse rate 120 per minute. Uh, abdominal examination here, the severe abdominal tenderness. Undergoes an emergency laparotomy, uh, omental perforation, and undergoes a patch repair. Uh, stabilized and shifted to the ward. Post operative day three, he has new onset fever with sudden worsening of the pain abdomen. Uh, the most common uh, differential diagnosis in this situation is an intraperitoneal abscess. A CT scan of the abdomen was performed, which actually confirmed there was an abdomen. There was an intra uh, abdominal abscess, which has developed post uh, surgery. And uh, uh, subsequently, a drain was put into this, and patient was managed with the percutaneous drain and the culture through ESB E coli and treated with uh, meropenem, uh, followed by artopenem uh, for uh, seven to 10 days. Now, uh, uh, what are our objectives in this case? What are the common organisms causing intraperitoneal abscess? What is the empirical antibiotic of choice in uh, intraperitoneal abscess? And what should be our duration of therapy in intraperitoneal abscesses? These are some of the learning points which we will discuss in the next few slides. Uh, now, what is an intraperitoneal abscess? Intraperitoneal abscess arises because of inflammation or disruption of the GI tract. This can arise from uh, not only the bowel, uh, uh, not only the bowel pathology, but also from the gynecological or urinary tract. This can be secondary to appendicitis, diabetes, pancreatitis, perforated ulcer, and uh, uh, IBD, this can also occur following trauma and abdominal surgery. Now, there are a few clues uh, what could be the primary pathology, where, and this can be based on the location of the intraperitoneal abscess. If the intraperitoneal abscess is in the right lower quadrant and pelvis, then most likely it is secondary to uh, acute appendicitis or a perforated appendix or an appendicular abscess. If the uh, intraperitoneal abscess is in left lower quadrant and pelvis, then diverticulitis, especially in elderly patients, is the common cause of intraperitoneal abscess. If the uh, intraperitoneal abscess is in lesser sac, then pancreatitis, and then subsequently developing an infected peripancreatic collection is the, uh, may be the common cause of uh, uh, intraperitoneal abscess. Now, um, uh, let's understand about some, uh, few, uh, uh, things about the microbiology of uh, the intraperitoneal abscess. This is uh, data from uh, CMC Valor. And this, they actually uh, divided the study population into two groups. One was the, uh, the group which had a multi-drug resistant organism and the other group had a non-multi-drug resistant organism group. As expected, as I had discussed earlier, the most common uh, pathogen, uh, uh, the most, uh, most uh, of the isolates, both in uh, uh, 
मल्टी ड्रग रेजिस्टेंट ऑर्गेनिज्म ग्रुप एंड नॉन मल्टी ड्रग रेजिस्टेंट ऑर्गेनिज्म ग्रुप फॉर पॉलीमाइक्रोबियल दे वर एज हाई एज फिफ्टी टू सिक्सटी परसेंट and uh, in the multi drug resistant organism group the most uh, 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 isolates uh, other than the polymicrobial isolates were esg e coli and few of uh, them were also papaverin resistant in the non multi drug resistant organism uh, there were a few atypical pathogens uh, like streptococcus enterococcus uh, were also isolated in this uh, group of the patients so again uh, polymicrobial uh, etiology is common because uh, uh, majority of the time the primary pathology is some breach in the bowel and bowel uh, is a polymicro about the flora is polymicrobial you have uh, gram negatives you have gram positives you have anaerobes so polymicrobial uh, isolates are very common in intraperitoneal abscess uh, abscesses and that's a very important point which we need to keep in mind when we are planning our therapy for these patients again uh, so, uh, similar data set from a different institute E. coli followed by Klebsiella is the most common isolate in intra-abdominal infections. Uh, this is uh, all I have already discussed. But very important point which I want to highlight here is that uh, there is a slight difference in microbiology when you are dealing with pathology in a small bowel versus large bowel. If you have uh, pathology in a large bowel, the common organisms are E. coli, bacteria, Klebsiella, Klebsiella, Proteus, Enterobacter, Streptococcus, and Candida. Whereas on the other hand, uh, if you have pathology in uh, proximal bowel, which has actually led to development of intraperitoneal abscess, the common organisms are anaerobic streptococci, streptococci, staph aureus, and candida. Candida is actually very a predominant pathogen, especially in surgical patients uh, who have been operated for proximal bowel uh, for intraperitoneal abscess. So we need to keep in mind where is the location of the abscess and where is the pathology in the bowel. So this actually helps us. Uh, Differentiate, uh, narrow down our microbiological uh, differentials and help in planning of uh, therapy better in uh, later on. Clinical features are fairly straightforward. The patient will present with fever, chills, abdominal pain, and tenderness over the involved area. Diagnosis is uh, UI ultrasound and the CT are the two modalities which we commonly use. Uh, CT actually is slightly better. Uh, and then uh, ultrasound uh, and this uh, sensitivity is also higher. And CT, if you see uh, extra luminal gas uh, and along with the collection, which is highly suggestive of uh, intraperitoneal abscess. Manage, coming to the management of intraperitoneal abscess, actually my teacher always used to tell me that uh, intraperitoneal abscess is a surgical uh, disease. It's not a medical disease. And uh, surgery, uh, surgical source control or source control via percutaneous drain is very, very important in management of uh, intraperitoneal abscess. Uh, and it's actually the most important inter intervention in the management of intraperitoneal abscess. And now, uh, this uh, uh, surgical or a percutaneous drain uh, actually help not only is therapeutic, but also helps obtain sample for uh, gram stain and cultures. Uh, if uh, during surgery we can also repair any anatomical or structural defects or perforation, uh, so, uh, source control helps us uh, shorten the duration of the antibiotic therapy, thereby preventing the antimicrobial resistance. Most clinical treatment failure are actually because of failure to achieve a good source control, either through uh, percutaneous drainage or uh, open surgical drainage. Uh, so it is very important to involve our surgeons very early in, in the illness uh, of an intraperitoneal abscess for the for the management. Now coming to the antibiotics for intraperitoneal abscess, uh, if we have a stable host. We can wait till the cultures are obtained. Uh, if we have a hemodynamically unstable patient, then urgent surgical intervention plus antibiotic is the way forward. Uh, coming to the antibiotics. Uh, Again, stable host, tetracycline, tazobactam, or ceftriaxone plus metronidazole is the uh, combination which we can use. We need to keep in mind here is that tetracycline, tazobactam itself has a very good anaerobic uh, coverage. In fact, anaerobic coverage of tetracycline, tazobactam is much better than metronidazole. So when you are using tetracycline, tazobactam, or even meropenem uh, in your patients, you do not need to uh, give uh, additional metronidazole coverage for these patients. However, when you are using it uh, with fluoroquinolone or ceftriaxone, they do not have a, a adequate uh, 
um, anaerobic term rate. So in that situation, you need to add metronidazole uh, for your patients. If you have a hemodynamically unstable patient, straight away use meropenem. If somebody has acquired the infection nosocomially and hemodynamically unstable, a polymyxin combination therapy uh, plus minus uh, TG cycling or some other agent may be considered uh, from case to case basis, depending on your local antimicrobial resistance patterns. Uh, the local antimicrobial resistance patterns are very, very important because they are different in different hospitals. The uh, antimicrobial resistance rates uh, for, uh, and carbapenem uh, production are uh, much different in my hospital uh, compared to a primary care hospital. So it depends on where you are practicing and what are your antimicrobial resistance rates and how unstable is your post. Now, all these factors need to be figured together when you are choosing your antibiotics for these patients. The duration of antibiotic, as I said earlier, shorter is the buzzword when you are uh, looking at antibiotic therapy in infectious diseases. And there was this very large, interesting RCT which was conducted last, which was conducted two years back and published last year, uh, uh, known as STOP IT trial. In this uh, uh, RCT, there were 518 patients which were randomized, and they were uh, patients who had complicated intra-abdominal infection. They were uh, the, st uh, the study population was divided into two groups. Uh, one was the conventional group in which antibiotics were continued for up to two days after the resolution of fever or leukocytosis, and the maximum duration was 10 days. The other group, the experimental group, uh, received uh, four to five days of antibiotic therapy. And this is considering when all the patients in both the groups have had a very good source controls in terms of either open surgical drainage or a percutaneous uh, drainage. And the primary outcome which they studied was the composite of surgical site infection, uh, recurrent intra-abdominal infection, or death within 30 days. What they found in, that, uh, in their study was that there was no uh, difference uh, and no statistically significant difference in uh, the control group versus the experimental group. The, uh, and what we can conclude from the study was that the shorter duration of therapy uh, is as good as a longer duration of therapy so once you have achieved a good source control. Now, moving on to the third case, uh, this is a 54-year-old farmer who presented with right upper quadrant pain, vomiting and fever for last 10 days. Is a poorly controlled diabetes. Clinical examination, except for fever, was grossly unremarkable. Per abdominal examination, there was tenderness in right hypochondrium. His TLC uh, was 17,000 with a neutrophil of 90%, creatinine 1.2. LFT was deranged. Uh, there was raised uh, bilirubin, and uh, SGT and HGPT both were elevated. An ultrasound was performed, and it can. Uh, Noted that there was a hypoecclesion with internal airports reflecting debris of partition uh, on the ultrasound. Uh, CT confirmed that there was a uh, large abscess in the right lobe of liver, and we can see that there was there is an enhancing ring around it. So this is a, a case of liver abscess, and uh, we will be discussing about uh, liver abscess in the next few slides. Coming to the mechanism of liver abscess formation, is, uh, the most common mechanism is actually portal vein pyemia. It is because of uh, uh, leakage, bowel leakage, and peritonitis, and transmigration of uh, the, um, uh, the microorganisms uh, through the portal vein into the uh, uh, liver. This can also occur because of the direct spread from uh, direct spread from biliary infection, especially in uh, those who have a uh, uh, biliary structure, biliary malignancies, uh, those who have undergone a, a, an ERCP and a stent placement. This can also uh, occur following that. It can also be secondary A2 uh, hematogenous seeding, and the most common isolate in this setting would be Staph aureus, uh, Streptococci, and Burkholderia pseudomoli. In a uh, Burkholderia pseudomoli is a uh, positive organism for meliodosis, uh, seen in patients who have a very poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, and the patient usually presents with uh, uh, multivisceral abscesses. This can also occur following surgical or penetrating wounds, following a trauma. The, uh, coming to the microbiology, uh, if the uh, pathogenesis is photopyemia, then the most uh, uh, common um, the microorganism is uh, poly, actually polymicrobial, it, which includes Klebsiella, E. coli, anaerobes, uh, bacteroids, uh, uh, then followed by Klebsiella pneumoniae, E. coli, anaerobes, and Streptococcus miliary group. 
Klebsiella pneumonia uh, is an important pathogen here and also important to understand a uh, strain of Klebsiella pneumonia also known as hypervirulent mucoviscous strain. Uh, this strain is actually very common in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Taiwan, China, India. Uh, so, uh, and it is actually geographically limited to these parts of the world. So, uh, these patients would actually present with a liver abscess, osteomyelitis, endothelmitis, uh, bloodstream infection, or even meningitis in some cases. And uh, they would be very, very sick. And you would be surprised when you uh, aspirate these uh, uh, abscesses, the isolate would be uh, pan susceptible. But uh, because of the toxin production, the patient would be very, very sick. So when you see uh, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia causing uh, liver abscess, which is pan susceptible, always keep in mind that this could be a hypervirulent mucoviscous uh, strain of Klebsiella pneumonia, uh, which is a very common cause of uh, community acquired liver abscess in India, Southeast Asia, uh, China, and Taiwan, and Thailand. Then uh, if the liver abscess formation is because of hematogenous spread, then it could be because of streptococcus miliary, staph aureus, uh, streptococcus pyogens, and the others could be burkholderia and even TB in some cases. Now, uh, coming to the imaging, uh, CT is obviously better than ultrasound because the sensitivity of the CT scan is much higher uh, compared to ultrasound. It is 95% versus 85%. CT uh, also helps us identify other intra-abdominal abnormalities like whether it is an appendicular abscess, perforation, diverticulitis, or any other pathology which can be uh, corrected, uh, which could be actually leading to the development of liver abscess. Right lobe uh, abscesses are much uh, more common than left lobe because the blood supply because of, it has a greater blood supply than the left lobe and the forward lobe. Diagnosis is fairly straightforward. You go ahead and aspirate the abscess along with that you send blood cultures. Uh, coming to the empirical antibiotic of choice, if the patient is not in shock, then you uh, give ceftriaxone plus metronidazole. Uh, metronidazole here is for anaerobic coverage because ceftriaxone and the anaerobic coverage is almost negligible. If you are using pipacillin tazolactam, uh, you can give it as a monotherapy, no need to add additional metronidazole. If the patient is in shock, then you give uh, meropenem, or if the patient has acquired the infection in a healthcare setting, then you may consider adding polymexins or yeah, the newer BLBIs like cetazidine meropenem plus minus estrogen. Also, if the patient is not in shock uh, and the patient has acquired the uh, uh, liver abscess in uh, care setting, then you may consider using uh, TG cycling as a monotherapy because TG cycling uh, has a very good uh, hepatobiliary concentration and achieves very high concentration very quickly in the uh, hepatobiliary system. So, very good agent for managing uh, hepatobiliary infection and can be considered provided the patient is not in shock. Uh, duration of the therapy, duration of treatment, if there is no drainage or if there is partial or incomplete drainage, the duration of therapy for liver abscess is six weeks. If, if you have achieved a very good source control by uh, adequate drainage, then two to four weeks of parental therapy followed by uh, oral therapy to complete six weeks of uh, total duration of therapy. Now quickly moving on to the anemic liver abscess it's caused by antimicrobial histolytica which is acquired by ingestion of food or, or water contaminated by human feces. The, um, we need to understand that most of the amoebic infections are actually asymptomatic and very few develop symptomatic infection in terms of amoebic dysentery, which is the most common presentation of uh, antimoeba histolytica infection. Uh, very rarely uh, you can see uh, extra intestinal diseases uh, with antimoeba histolytica when the trophozytes actually invade the intestinal mucosa and disseminate hematogenously. Liver abscesses are the most common extra intestinal presentation. The trophozytes reach the liver via the portal circulation and uh, form a large solitary abscess in the liver. The, uh, it has a uh, significant uh, male preponderance and it is uh, seven to 10 times more commonly seen in males, most commonly seen in fourth decade of life. The risk factors for development of liver abscess are immunosuppression, diabetes mellitus, cirrhosis, Travel to endemic areas. Uh, Southeast Asia actually is the endemic area. So, by endemic area, I mean Southeast Asia. And then, pregnancy and ethanol abuse. Ethanol abuse is a very common risk factor for development of uh, amoebic liver abscess. 
presentation, the patient would present with a right upper quadrant pain. Uh, many of these patients actually do not have fever, and fever is only present in 50% of the cases. Uh, patients would have nausea, vomiting, the onset would be subacute or chronic. Less than one third of uh, these patients would uh, either remember either present with diarrhea or these patients actually may not have, uh, never have uh, had an episode of diarrheal illness in the last few weeks. So diarrhea is not somewhat which we are looking into uh, when we are uh, looking at amoebic liver abscess because diarrhea is an infrequent presentation when somebody has presented with an amoebic liver abscess. Um, Less than 10% of these patients would uh, present with jaundice and radiological finding on chest x-ray, you may find an elevated left dome of diaphragm and uh, some of these patients actually have a uh, develop, uh, pleural effusion. This pleural effusion could be because of secondary, uh, because of uh, uh, inflammation, local inflammation, and this could be reactionary. And sometimes the liver abscess actually ruptures into the pleural space. So uh, the, the, that uh, amoebic liver abscess, which has ruptured, can also cause a pleural effusion because of the direct uh, effect over there. And many times uh, when we have done a PCR on pleural fluid as well as in the uh, uh, ruptured amoebic liver abscess, we have actually uh, confirmed that the pleural uh, fluid is also infected with um, uh, uh, antimicrobial histolytica. So uh, if you have a ruptured abscess and a pleural effusion, probably the uh, fusion is not reactionary, then uh, probably the uh, fusion is uh, secondary to the infection. Uh, however, if you do not have a ruptured abscess and only a fusion, then probably it is uh, a reactionary fusion. Ultrasound, you will find a well-defined hypoechoic lesion, mostly solitary, right low, uh, in majority of the time, up to 80% of the cases, uh, uh, the amoebic liver abscess are in right low. CT scan, you would see low density mass with a peripheral enhancing rim, uh, uh, like a, a bacterial abscess. Uh, and now, what are the indications for aspiration of a liver abscess? Now, those patients who have uh, whose age is more than 55, size is more than five centimeter, and uh, they are actually not responding to therapy, uh, not responding to medical therapy for more than seven days. Also, we are we are not unsure about the diagnosis, and we want to rule out the pyogenic abscess because the uh, duration of therapy is much longer in a pyogenic abscess compared to an amoebic liver abscess. And this could be considered as an adjunct to medical therapy in somebody who has had a partial response uh, with medical therapy alone. Uh, abscess in the left lobe always needs to be aspirated because they have a very high risk of rupture into the uh, pericardial cavity, uh, which can actually lead to a sudden cardiac death. So left lobe abscess is uh, it's an absolute indication for aspiration. And uh, sometimes we uh, do it uh, to reduce uh, period of uh, disability. Many of these patients uh, may have some sort of hemodynamic uh, instability. So uh, to achieve an early source control, we may consider aspirating these abscesses. Treatment is fairly straightforward. Nothing much has changed over time. And uh, metronidazole or tenodazole is the drug of choice. Metronidazole 500. Uh, to 750, actually 750, uh, the dose is slightly higher when you are using metronidazole. It is 750 to 800 milligram thrice a day for seven to 10 days. Tenodazole is two gram once a day for five days. Cure rates are very high. 90% of these patients would achieve uh, 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 complete cure with uh, seven to 10 days of therapy. Uh, we also need to give uh, luminal agents after we have given tissue agents, and this is to eliminate the intraluminal cyst, even if the stool microscopy is negative, because actually th that is the source. That is from uh, that is the uh, the source which is actually led on to the development of a liver abscess. So very important to give luminal agents once we have given the tissue agents to prevent uh, to prevent further relapses in the future. So for this, we give dinoxanide pyroid, pyroid 500 milligrams TID for 10 days. Now coming to the uh, uh, acute cholangitis, uh, the, uh, these patients would actually present with fever, jaundice, and abdominal pain. This is the classical triad, also known as the charcoal triad. And uh, this develops as the uh, acute cholangitis develops as a result of stasis and infection in the biliary tree. And the risk factors include uh, biliary calculi, which is the most common. The biliary, uh, once we have a stone in the biliary uh, uh, tract, there is an obstruction to the flow and uh, of the bile uh, normal bile. Once you have an obstruction over there, uh, because of the uh, obstruction, uh, this, there is a stasis and uh, 
it actually provides a very good medium for infection and uh, it can lead to the de uh, development of the cholangitis. The other factors are biliary structures, malignancies, following ERCPs, and uh, some parasitic infections like uh, liver flukes. Now, there are a lot of mechanisms which are there to prevent development of acute cholangitis, like uh, sphincter of Fordi acts as a mechanical barrier. It actually does not allow the bacteria to migrate from the uh, uh, bowel uh, to the biliary tree. And then you have uh, um, bile salts, uh, which are present in the bile. They're actually bacteriostatic, uh, which also uh, prevents the overgrowth of the bacteria and prevents the infection. Also, there are uh, other multiple other mechanisms like uh, there is IgA, there is biliary mucus, which uh, both of which are actually uh, acting as an anti adherence factors, and these prevents colonization. Now, infection happens when you have a breach in uh, these normal protective barriers, and, uh, and, and the pathogenesis is once you have a bacterial obstruction, there is increased intrabiliary pressure, there is increased uh, permeability of biliary ductules, and because of that, there is translocation of bacteria and toxin for the portal circulation into the biliary tract. So this is how uh, acute cholangitis develops. Microbiology uh, is fairly uh, similar to what we see in uh, majority of the abdominal pathologies. Uh, the most common organisms is your uh, uh, polymicrobial flora, which includes a gram-negative and a gram-positive and anaerobes. But uh, coming to uh, monomicrobial etiologies, E. coli, Lepsula, and Bacteria, and Hippocus, and anaerobes are the common microorganisms encountered in acute cholangitis. Now, this is the uh, clinical feature. There are two uh, one is the charcoal triad, and one, and one is the Reynolds uh, pendant. Charcoal triad is a uh, triad of fever, abdominal pain, and jaundice. It is uh, for the clinical diagnosis, uh, whereas Reynolds pentad actually represents a uh, much severe form of cholangitis. You will have fever, uh, abdominal pain, jaundice. Along with that, if the patient has hypotension and altered mental status, this actually represents a superative or a severe form of acute cholangitis. Now, coming to the diagnosis, the patient will present with fever and chills. There would be a, a lab evidence of an inflammatory response in terms of neutrophilic leukocytosis and raised CRP. And there would be evidence of cholestasis. Uh, bilirubin would be more than two milligrams per deciliter. And the liver chemistry uh, uh, in terms of SGOT and AGPT would be elevated more than 1.5 times the upper limit of the normal. Imaging would confirm uh, there is either some pathology in the bile tract um, by, uh, biliary tree, or there is a biliary dilatation or evidence of underlying etiology like a stone structure or stent or a compression on the uh, biliary tree. Now, uh, how do we, we evaluate these patients? Uh, when we have a suspected cholangitis, we do an ultrasound. If it is normal, then we do a CT. If it, CT is also normal, then we do an MRCP. If the MRCP is contraindicated, then we straight away go, uh, go ahead and do ERCP. If the patient is pregnant, then we do an uh, endoscopic ultrasound. If the patient has a, uh, the charcoal triad is positive, then, uh, and the patient has an abnormal LFT, and the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we bypass all these steps and straight away do an ERCP. Now, coming to the management, management is actually based on the disease severity. And uh, uh, disease severity, uh, the moderate cholangitis is defined as anyone who has a TLC of more than 12,000 or less than 4,000, more than 102.2 degree Fahrenheit of fever, age more than 75, hyperbilirubinemia, that is total bilirubin more than 5, and hypoalbuminemia. Whereas on the other hand, uh, severe or superative cholangitis, you would find a target organ damage. And this could be uh, involving cardiovascular system. You, uh, your patient may have hypertension or myocarditis, um, neurological dysfunction in terms of altered mental status or loss of consciousness, ARDS, uh, P, uh, PF ratio less than 200, AKI, hepatic dysfunction in terms of failure, uh, uh, some, uh, signs of failure like prothrombin time more than 1.5. Hematological dysfunction when you uh, develop uh, thrombocytopenia or cytopenias, uh, thrombocytopenia less than uh, one lakh uh, of platelets. Management uh, is uh, when you have a, a patient who is a low risk, community acquired, uh, or uh, very uh, uh, low risk of uh, multi drug resistant pathogen, then in that situation you can use the precedent basobactam. 
high risk patient immodernally unstable uh, uh, who has a severe disease or a superative disease then you use meropenem healthcare associated infection uh, immodernally unstable patient uh, uh, hypotense uh, evidence of superative complications as which i discussed in the previous slide then in that situation uh, 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 meropenem or a newer blbi combination like cefalidem or tum plus astronap Uh, or a combination of poly B plus TG cycling may be considered. If you uh, if your hospital rates of MRSA are very high, uh, which is actually not the scenario which we commonly encounter in India, our MRSA rates are pretty low. Uh, so uh, depending depending on case to case basis, vancomycin may be considered if you are uh, concerned about MRSA also. Now uh, coming to the biliary drainage, actually uh, this is very very important to achieve source control in these patients, and the timing is actually based on disease severity and the uh, response. If you have a severe disease, it is it has to be done urgently within 24 hours. If it is mild to moderate disease, then you can uh, do it within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, the choice of procedure is uh, it, it could be an ERCP or a percutaneous drainage or an open surgical drainage. Nowadays, uh, uh, ERCP is uh, the preferred modality of the treatment for management of acute uh, pharyngitis. Now, uh, coming to the, my last case of uh, of the day, this is a 32-year-old female admitted with severe acute necrotizing pancreatitis, multiple extra pancreatic complications like ARDS, AKI. On day 28 of hospitalization, has new onset of fever and severe abdominal pain. This uh, look, before moving forward in this case, let's. discuss a few things about the what are the local complications of acute pancreatitis if it is less than 4 weeks uh, from the onset of acute pancreatitis then the complication can be acute peripancreatic fluid collection or an acute necrotic collection if it is more than 4 weeks then pancreatic pseudocyst or wall of uh, pancreatic necrosis or wall which we commonly use uh, in our medical terms uh, can be uh, the complication uh, uh, So, what is an acute peripancreatic fluid collection? This actually does not have a well-defined wall. It uh, the patient would remain asymptomatic, and this would res uh, result spontaneously in seven to ten days. And there is no need for drainage for uh, this acute peripancreatic fluid collection. Only six percent of these acute peripancreatic fluid collection for uh, persist beyond four weeks. However, this peripancreatic collection can become infected, and if you notice signs of clinical Uh, signs of infections like fever, abdominal pain, increasing leukocytosis, then probably consider that this peripancreatic collection has become infected. It, it is either an infected peripancreatic collection or an infected necrosis, uh, depending on the time from the onset of the acute pancreatitis. A infected necrosis is actually the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in acute pancreatitis. Around 30% of the patient develop infected necrosis. infectious complication will occur within uh, 14 days and uh, the targeted antibiotic therapy based on gram strain and culture is actually the way forward to prevent these cases now uh, when do we suspect uh, an infected pancreatic uh, necrosis when you a uh, patient becomes hemodynamically unstable patient has fever increasing tlc failure to improve after 10 to 14 days of hospitalization that is when we should keep, uh, suspect that this could be an infected pancreatic necrosis Now coming to the microbiology, microbiology is pretty much the same. E. coli and Klebsiella are the two most common uh, pathogens uh, which we encounter uh, in our clinical practice in infected pancreatic necrosis. Now how do we manage these infected pancreatic necrosis? Once we have suspected it, we uh, start off with an uh, uh, empirical antibiotic, obtain a CT guided or an ultrasound guided FNC for gram stain and aerobic culture. If uh, the culture, uh, the gram stain and aerobic culture confirms necrosis, then we treat accordingly. If the patient is clinically stable, we continue antibiotics and observe. And if the patient is not responding, then we consider uh, drainage of the infected pancreatic necrosis endoscopically or uh, percutaneous through percutaneous drains. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then prompt surgical debridement uh, should be considered. Now, one very important point which I want to highlight here is that. Routine use of prophylactic antibiotics in severe acute pancreatitis is actually not recommended, and it has been shown that it actually does not prevent the development of uh, infected pancreatic necrosis. So, routine use of antibiotic prophylaxis is a big no-no. 
the use of antibiotics in patients with sterile necrosis to prevent development of infected necrosis is also not recommended. So unless you suspect or uh, that your patient has developed infection, there is no role of routine prophylactic antibiotic uh, in a patient with acute pancreatitis. Now, coming to the last slide of my talk, uh, infect, uh, intra-abdominal infections are complex uh, infections. They need multidisciplinary team approach. And you need to have a, a physician, intensivist, infection disease physician, micro, uh, microbiologist, surgeons, intervention radiologist, gastroenterologist, GI surgeons, so, so then this, uh, this is a multidisciplinary team approach and everyone needs to play their part for uh, uh, improved outcomes. The site of infection of uh, acquisition of infection, local antimicrobial resistance rates, and the hemodynamically stability of the patient, stability or unstability of the patient, decides your empirical treatment of choice. Uh, source control is, seems to be the buzzword. Uh, where we need to achieve source control uh, as early as possible. Source control helps us reduce the short uh, duration of the antibiotic therapy and thereby de uh, preventing development of antimicrobial resistance in future. Robust data now is available which supports shorter process of antibiotics once we have achieved source control in majority of the clinical syndromes which I discussed today. Thank you and I'm open to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Vikas, a wonderful presentation. So just, uh, just stop the share screen, okay? So friends, please post your questions. Before that, uh, just like to uh, reiterate some of the points and add a few points probably to what Dr. Deswal has just said. So, uh, you know, first of all, he told you about the Runyon's criteria that uh, is prevalent in uh, secondary bacterial peritonitis. Uh, uh, not spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Yes. yes. Sometimes you have patients with cirrhosis and ascites. So generally they get SBP, but sometimes they do get perforation peritonitis. So this criteria is very important. You know, he showed you the criteria, especially the yes. uh, criteria uh, or the low glucose. One has to be aware of this, you know, these uh, differentiating points in the. Absolutely. And uh, apart from that, uh, the other thing is, uh, even a patient who does not have CLD, he, come, he may come with perforation peritonitis, sepsis, and altered LFT, and that may mislead you to think that he has CLD. Uh, so this is very important. This happens sometimes, and you get misled. So this uh, criteria has to be borne in mind. The other thing is uh, about uh, cholangitis. So about cholangitis, you know, this is one of the few conditions, which, in fact, the only condition in which there's no primary disease of the liver. But the LCOT PT can go beyond 1000. The LCOT PT can go beyond 1000. This is a very important point to diagnose acute cholangitis clinically. Otherwise, uh, only liver diseases cause LCOT PT greater than uh, 1000. Now, the other thing is about coverage uh, for gram positive, empirical coverage for gram positive. So, you know, newer literature now says that even enterococci should be covered at least empirically, or if you don't have any culture positivity, because enterococci are uh, normally inhabitants of the GI tract. And the you know, literature is now saying even staph and strep, strep and staph has mentioned. So maybe uh, some vancomycin or linzolate, ampicillin probably won't work in our country for enterococci, but vancomycin linzolate can be added initially when the patient has come to you along with meropenem or piplacin, tazobactam, whatever you're adding, gram positive as well as gram negative. Then uh, about Canada. So, so he mentioned about Canada, you know, can, especially in surgical patients who have been operated. So if patient has uh, peritonitis, has a perforated bowel, has gone into shock, then upfront only, I think you should start uh, antifungal. Uh, or if the patient is stable, then you give antibiotics for 48 hours. If it's not improving, then it has to be started. We had patients where culture grew positive after perforation. For mm. You know, the, after isopical surgery or GI surgery, this has happened and this is a recommendation. So Canada has to be borne in mind. Entrococci has to be borne in mind. So these things are also very important uh, in covering uh, perforation peritonitis or peritonitis occurring from the bowel. And again, coming back to liver abscess. So liver abscess, another thing is, you know, sometimes these patients do not have signs and symptoms. The you may miss a little bit of tenderness if you don't examine properly, especially in the ICU setting. And uh, they have sepsis. And if they have, you know, perforation, they can be really bad. Liver abscess can be bad to manage. 
sometimes you know there's a mortality of 20 to 25 percent reported in literature and you have to have adequate uh, drainage procedure either percutaneous drainage or surgical drainage or even you know advanced centers to endoscopic drainage so liver abscess has to be uh, managed carefully especially if there's perforation uh, and he has very nicely shown you the two kinds basically amoebic as well as uh, bacterial but uh, the aspirate is very important do the aspirate sometimes it's fungal also tubercular also different kind of etiologies do come out huh? that's very important and uh, upfront you know you cannot really differentiate amoebic from bacterial because there are differentiating points but they don't always help so you have to give metronidazole also along with your bacterial cover or vice versa whatever your clinical suspicion is till you actually prove it the, the, that was another thing now coming to uh, carbopenemanence it is important to realize that they have good anaerobic cover a very basic thing i'm saying but benopenem epenem which we give so frequently they have very good anaerobic cover piperacillin tazobactam has very good cover so i just wanted to ask you one thing dr deswal where does tendamycin start for anaerobic cover we, we generally give metronidazole so it, it also has a good uh, reasonable anaerobic coverage very good antibiotic gram positive gram negative anaerobic uh, little bit of everything is there in that yeah, so because some gram positive cover also you can get with clindamycin with metal. Yes, yes. Okay. So anything you want to add to what I said, Dr. Deswal? No, you very nicely summed it up uh, in a few minutes. Yeah, one more thing I wanted to add about the CT guided FNAC in pancreatitis. Uh, you know, whenever you are suspecting pancreatic infection, CT guided FNAC has had become controversial and now actually the literature is saying not ready to go for it. There are a few reasons for that. One, you know, they have done meta analysis and they have seen uh, the outcome does not change whether you do right FNC or do not do it. And the culture yield is not, not very much. A lot of these patients are already receiving antibiotics. Yeah. There is a risk of disseminating the infection. Apart from that, you can actually cause some complication. You know, pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ. Yes, yes. FNC is actually going out and out. So you have to treat empirically. That is one more thing I wanted to add. Apart from that, I don't think I have uh, anything else to add. You have covered very nicely. Uh, beautiful. I think you have answered any questions. Let me just uh, see the questions one sec for everybody's benefit. So, how to confirm the diagnosis of amoebic liver abscess? So, amoebic PCR. So, I would like to add to that, you know, uh, even amoebic uh, serology is a good test. So, amoebic serology would be positive with any patient who's had amoebiasis, okay, in the past also. But a negative Amoebic serology is very helpful. It will rule out. It has a very high specificity. Absolutely agree. Okay. Positive will not tell you because amoebic PCR, as Sir has said, is a very good test, but it's not available so easily. That's one of the things. Then coming to the next question, uh, a wet mount, wet mount from liver aspirate. Then duration of antibiotics in cases of infected uh, necrotic pancreatitis. I think ANP means uh, acute necrotic pancreatitis. Acute necrotizing pancreatitis. Yes. Yeah, so duration of antibiotics has to be prolonged. If you have infected pancreatitis, it has to go on till the patient improves. It goes into four weeks, six weeks. Yeah. Like so once you have that, and actually most of the times the diagnosis is clinical, and you continue the antibiotics, they go on and on, and if the patient is not improving, you will have to give antifungal. You have to cover candida also. So that, that is another thing. Whenever the patient is not improving. So that is the other thing. Any other questions? I think that's about it. Huh? Yeah. Okay then. So uh, I think friends, there are no more questions. Thanks a lot to Dr. Deswal, sir. Very nice talk and uh, hope to see him again on our platform some other time. Take care, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good day.